Perfect. As the clock rolls over to six o'clock, I think we should make a start. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, and thank you for coming back after two days of digital ecologies. Uh, so welcome to everyone in the Zoom and also everyone on the YouTube Live. Um, thank you all for what has been a fascinating two days of presentations and discussion. Um, we've been quite overwhelmed, actually, with the engagement with this event. It's been extraordinary, as well as the feedback, the comments, the questions, all of which really speaks to the quality of all the work that we've seen here. Um, we will say a few more closing, closing remarks to that effect at the very end, so do stick around for five minutes for that. Uh, but now we're extremely excited to be joined by Professor Etienne Benson to deliver the second and closing keynote lecture of this Digital Ecologies 2021 workshop. Professor Benson is an Associate Professor of the History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania by way of MIT, Harvard and the Max Planck Institute of the History of Science. He's a historian of environmental sciences, environmentalism and human-animal relations in the 20th and 21st centuries and has published a number of studies on the history of techniques for studying, surveilling and simulating the behaviours of non-human animals and ecosystems for which he's received various prizes and accolades. His 2010 book, Wired Wilderness, Technologies of Tracking and the Making of Modern Wildlife from the John Hopkins University Press is really a, a seminal text on the tagging and tracking practices of wildlife biologists, tracing the evolution, the uses, impacts of these now widespread techniques across numerous different species and contexts. And it's actually through this fantastic publication that myself and the other organizers, Johnny and Adam, were introduced to Professor Benson's work. And when putting together this conference, he was really one of the first names on the list of our aspirational speakers. His most recent book is called Surroundings, A History of Environments and Environmentalisms, a study of the various efforts to reimagine and rematerialize the concept of environment over the past two centuries. He's also part of the very interesting Digital Animalities Project, exploring the role of ubiquitous media for changing the meanings and possibilities of human-animal relations. And you can actually find the link for that site on the other links page of the Digital Ecologies website. Uh, he also has a forthcoming book, I believe, supported by the National Science Foundation on the subject of the practice and politics of data in hydrology and fluvial geomorphology in the US from the 1940s to the 1970s. Today, Professor Benson's talk will focus on the ways that digital media and digitization affect our understanding of animal pasts. He will draw upon his work on methods of animal history, like his 2011 paper, Animal Rights, um, a 2016 symposium he organized entitled Animals in the Archives, as well as some forthcoming work uh, and his own historical work on wildlife radio tracking, urban squirrels, birds, and power lines. Uh, I think that's enough of me speaking. So, uh, Professor, welcome, uh, Professor Benson, welcome. It's really good to have you here. Uh, thank you, Henry, for that really generous introduction. And thank you um, to you and to Johnny and Adam for the invitation. Um, I haven't been able to participate in quite as much um, of the past two days as I'd hoped but I have dipped in and out and it's just been incredibly um, stimulating. Um, so I think everybody should be really, really pleased with the way this has turned out. Um, so I've been told I have about 45 minutes to speak, um, but I know it's in addition to being a stimulating two days, it's probably been a long, a long two days with a lot of screen time. Um, so I'm gonna try to keep uh, my comments a little bit shorter than that if I can. And my theme is one that I've been thinking about for a while. Um, from various angles, but have only recently tried to articulate uh, more explicitly. Um, and that theme is how digitalization is uh, generating new affordances for engaging with animal paths and, and in the process possibly also uh, generating new responsibilities for historians. Um, let me now uh, see if I can share my screen. Get to the first slide there. Okay, can you see that okay? Great, okay. I should say that my um, thinking about this topic, um, uh, the occasion for my thinking about this topic more explicitly is involvement in this digital animalities group um, led by Jody Berlin um, for the past few years. Um, and I want us to start out by thanking her and the other participants in that research initiative for the, the motivation and inspiration. 
My talk is in three parts. Um, I'll begin with a review of how historians have thought about the challenges of writing history centered on non-human animals, including my own thinking on the production and interpretation of more than human traces. And then, but also the work of other scholars um, on the archive as a site of embodied and affective encounters with various traces of non-human pasts. In the second part, I'll talk about some recent developments in the digitization of historical archives, uh, specifically archives having to do with non-human animals, as well as the potential for other kinds of traces, including tracking data generated by animal ecologists um, to become sources for historical scholarship. And then finally, in the third section, I'll conclude with some thoughts about how the production and use of these kinds of digital traces may shift the way we think not only about the writing of history, but also about the historian's ethical and political responsibilities. Okay, now to the first part. So in some sense, historians have always been interested in animals um, as sources of energy and materials, as beasts of burden and war, as threats to human lives and livelihoods, as sources of, of companionship and entertainment, um, as powerful symbols. And whenever I'm tempted to think that animal history is something radically new, it's helpful to remind myself that Thucydides has some good passages on cavalry, so animals are not an entirely new subject for study. And in that light, the emergence of animal history as a field in the past few decades doesn't represent a radically new subject so much as a radically new approach to an old subject. And what, the, what makes the approach new is that it attempts to center animals as actors or agents in history rather than seeing them only as passive resources for human action or as nothing more than symbolic representations of human ideas and social relationships. And of course, I don't have to say to this audience that the move to center animals is part of a broader move to decenter the human by extending attention to other realms of the living and non-living and to the webs of relation that bring them together or in some cases push them apart. And so animal history in this sense is just one little wave within this much larger, uh, more than human sea change. I still think we can learn something by focusing in on the animal wave um, and particularly on the conversation about research methods um, that has taken place among animal historians over the past two decades. Um, and a, a conversation that I think has shifted from a largely theoretical debate over whether and how conventional notions of agency and voice can be extended to animals to an increasing interest in the practicalities and materialities of recovering and interpret interpreting traces of animal pasts. And so what I wanna do in this first part is recount my understanding of that, uh, that shift and, and also how my own work has figured into it um, as well as the work of others. So for me, one of the, so I keep getting my slides uh, off screen. Um, so for me, one of the really uh, touchstones of this methodological conversation in animal history remains Erica Fudge's essay, A Left-Handed Blow, which appeared in 2002 um, in a volume uh, representing animals edited by Nigel Rothfels. And as Fudge noted, despite the publication of a number of pioneering works of animal history in the 80s and 90s, very little had been written about historiographic issues raised in writing about animals at the time. And her essay represented a really important inaugural, inaugural moment of methodological self-reflection. And so in that essay, Fudge argued that a genuine history of animals, that is a history that centered animals as historical uh, actors was in her words, impossible for two reasons. The first was the lack of documents produced by animals themselves. And the second was animals lack of historical consciousness, their inability to conceive of historical periods and temporalities in the ways that humans did. And given these limits, she argued the best historians could hope for was what she called the history of human attitudes towards animals. And on its face, this might seem like a retreat from the project of centering animals, which I just said was kind of cent central to the, the new field of animal history. Uh, but Fudge argued but that the history of human attitudes towards animals could be used to deconstruct the category of the human itself and to show how human attitudes were related to material changes. And both of those moves, um, she said, you know, argued, I think pretty com compellingly had important implications for our relations to real animals, both in the past and the present. Now, over the decade uh, or two, uh, following the publications of Fudge's essay, these issues of representation and reality, agency and voice, of the possibility or impossibility of a genuine history of animals, um, and, of and of scholars' ethical responsibilities to the subjects of the research continued to perplex historians 
of animals. And in some ways they continue to perplex them today. Uh, but as is often the case with these kinds of naughty problems, um, rather than being definitively unraveled or sorted out once and for all, I think, I think most animal historians have simply uh, resigned themselves to living with these uh, tensions and contradictions. So instead of one position winning out over another one, um, the debates have simply lost steam. And most historians who write about animals today have recognized that these intentions are important, they're central, they need to be kept in view, but they're also basically unresolvable. And they've shifted their attention to more practical questions of how to know and narrate animal pasts. Now, for my own part, the, 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 the part of Fudge's essay that really stuck with me um, was the claim that animals did not produce records that could be interpreted by historians. That is, the claim that the only records we have of animal pasts have been produced by humans. And this is a completely obvious and uncontestable claim, so long as one assumes that only documents in human language count as real historical sources. That argument, while common, commonsensical, has al always seemed kind of tautological to me. To claim that historical scholarship can only be based on, on documents written or spoken by humans doesn't just imply that a, historian, uh, a history of animals is impossible, it kind of assumes it in advance. So in my own contribution to this conversation, uh, the essay Animal Rights, which I can't believe was published a decade ago now, but I guess time flies. Um, I made two interconnected arguments that I thought made uh, a real history of animals possible. And both of them centered on a question of what counts as a legitimate historical document uh, or source. So the first of these arguments was that in fact, there are lots of ways that animals produce records that persist over time and are available to the historian as aids in understanding the past. These may, might not be precisely historical documents uh, in the classic sense, but they are traces of past lives and actions that can include all sorts of material artifacts, uh, including the bodily remains of the animals themselves as collected in natural history museums, for instance, um, as well as the marks that animals leave on landscapes, both small and large. And the availability of such traces to the historian, I think obviously depends on human actions and attitudes, but I don't think it can be reduced to them. And while it might be unconventional to draw on such sources for the social and cultural history of recent times, it hardly seems unprecedented if we look at fields like ancient history, where archaeological evidence is, is uh, more or less um, uh, essential. Um, or even if you look at other fields like environmental history or the history of technology and material culture, uh, where it's not uncommon to draw on landscapes or on machines or other kinds of non-textual sources um, to, to make arguments. The second argument that I made um, in that essay was maybe a little more convoluted, um, but I still think more or less uh, right. Um, and I argued that implicit in the idea that history could only be written using documents written or spoken by humans was the assumption that textual and oral history records were in fact written or spoken by humans alone in splendid isolation from the rest of the living world. The idea that somehow the act of writing or speaking was disembodied and detached from its multi-species context in a way that other human actions weren't. So on the contrary, I argued that the act of writing, if we regard writing as something that's embodied, embedded, situated, material, um, has always been a multi-species affair, uh, whether in the direct sense of animal materials being used in the production of paper and ink um, and other materials, um, or in the indirect sense of human writers always being shaped by uh, multi-species ecologies and specifically by their relations to non-human animals. So my conclusion was that even if historians were to limit themselves to working only with documents, kind of conventional documents produced by humans, it would be a mistake to view those documents, documents as being produced only by humans or as telling us about nothing about the kind of multi-species context in which they were produced. Now this argument might seem a little far from the theme of this conference, uh, digital ecologies, but in my own kind of idiosyncratic intellectual tra trajectory, they're actually very tightly intertwined. So my interest in animal traces was initially sparked by my work on the history of wildlife radio tracking. Um, and it, in, in the, the book that Henry mentioned, uh, Wire Wilderness. Uh, and so it was through the lens of research on a technique for generating inscriptions of animal uh, movements that I read claims about the impossibility of animals generating documents that could be interpreted by, um, by historians. Obviously humans were necessary for the production and interpretation of wildlife radio tracking data, but you know, immersed as I, as I was in environmental history on the, on the one hand and in practice oriented STS on the other, um, I wasn't willing to accept that animals uh, played no material role whatsoever in the production of such data. 
And if animals did play a, a material role in the generation of such traces, then I thought it's not unreasonable to think that such traces could be sources for a genuine history of animals and not just a history of attitudes about animals. So to put it another way, um, I argued, and I would still argue that the technicity of trace making applies to non-human animals just as much as it does uh, to humans. Um, and that as the material affordances for making and preserving traces changes, uh, change, so does the historical record. And as the historical record changes, so do the possibilities for introducing new actors or voices into history. Um, so for me, the study of recent technologies for studying animal behavior and ecology was really central to my effort um, to grapple with the fundamental methodological challenges of animal history. Before I move on um, to discussing uh, in more concrete ways, uh, digital archives and traces, I want to mention one other important influence on my thinking about the methodological challenges of animal history. And namely, that's the, the work of Zed, Zed Tortorisi, a historian of sexuality and human animal relations in colonial Latin America. Um, Zeb and I organized the um, conference that Henry mentioned in 2016 on animals in the archive, and, and I got to know his work uh, uh, in that way, uh, as well as through reading it. So Tortorisi describes the animal archive not as a disembodied repository of documents in the abstract, or even just as a collection of material traces of animal pasts, um, but rather as a site for embodied and affective encounters with those traces as they've been shaped by various histories of selection, preservation, um, decay, um, and destruction. As Tortorisi argues, these histories continue all the way through the moment when the historian sits down with a book of worm-eaten pages, perhaps made of parchment, written with a quill pen, using ink made of bone char, bound together with animal-based glue, while mice and cockroaches rustle around in the stacks and pigeons roost on the roof. They also, these histories also include the historian's kind of affective encounter with descriptions or depictions of past animals that might evoke powerful emotions, disgust for, in, for instance. Emotions that can't, I think, in any reasonable way be reduced to the question of, of, of whether or not those sources represent past animals um, accurately or not. So in short, uh, Tortorisi's work taught me that it's not just the moment of production of the historical trace that is a material and multi-species affair. It's also the long history of transmission um, and transformation of those traces up to the moment when it's encountered by the historian. And, and then, you know, also understanding the historian as an embodied, affective human animal um, who is part of a multi-species community, not just in every kind of everyday life, um, not just when he or she kind of goes, goes home at the end of the day, but also in the very act of, of researching and writing history. So where this leaves me and where this leaves us, I think, is with the idea that history um, and historical scholarship um, are multi-species affairs from the wor word go, um, all the way from the production of more than human traces to their preservation and transmission to the archival encounter um, through to the writing, writing and reading of, of historical texts. Okay. So that's some of the, the background on kind of my own kind of pathway in thinking about how and whether um, animals can become kind of genuine uh, subjects of history, um, channeling that question through the question of whether or not there are sources, kind of documents or other kinds of traces that we can use to retell those histories. Let me move now to the second part of the talk um, where I'll focus on, on, on the digital uh, more specifically. So over the past uh, several decades, that is precisely during the period that animal history has been maturing as a field, during which this methodological conversation has been shifting from concerns with voice and agency and representation in the abstract towards more concrete, maybe practical concerns with uh, more than human traces. During, during the same period, the pace of digitalization, digitization of historical records has accelerated dramatically along with the proliferation of new kinds of, of born digital records. This flood of digital sources has produced a lot of opportunities and also a lot of uh, practical and, and even ethical challenges. And so what I'd like to do now is describe um, how these digital developments are connected to animal history. I'll start with the digitization of existing um, non-digital records and then turn to the production of new kinds of born digital records. And I should say this part of the talk is largely kind of descriptive um, in focus and in, in the third and last section of the talk, I'll, I'll try to contextualize and critique a little bit. 
So starting with the, the question of digitizing existing records, the past decade or so has witnessed uh, the emergence of some concerted efforts to digitize animal focused uh, publications uh, and archival collections. And in the United, in the United States, um, one of the most ambitious of these efforts uh, recently is one called the Animal Turn, uh, a project headed by the North Carolina State University Library, um, along with the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the ASPCA. This project started in 2018, ran for three years, and has digitized about 150,000 pages of the ASPCA's um, records, as well as nearly 240,000 pages of the library's um, animal rights and welfare co collection, which include um, some institutional records and the papers of the animal rights philosopher Tom Regan and other material. This project is more or less complete, um, as, as far as I know, and it dramatically widens access to the records of, animal, of the animal rights movement. Um, and welfare movement in the United States. So as important as these kinds of projects are, and I do think they are important and should continue, I actually think their significance for animal history pales in comparison to the more general digitization of historical sources, particularly in newspapers. Despite what, what are by now some well-known problems of uneven geographical and linguistic coverage, as well as problems with um, the uneven accuracy of, of uh, optical character recognition, um, the digitization of newspapers, magazines, and other publications in recent, recent decades has been a boon for historical research of all kinds. But I think it's been especially beneficial for animal historians, precisely because their subject has uh, traditionally been so marginalized. And what I mean by that is that because non-human animals have typically not been the main focus of journalists and editors or of readers, it's been very difficult to find them in traditional indexes, and let alone by trying to read you know, newspapers, uh, scan newspapers by eye. So in that sense, like writing about animals is very different than writing about topics that tend to get uh, front page coverage, topics like politics, diplomacy, labor, business, even media history. Um, animals often get mentioned only in passing as subordinate aspects of seemingly more important topics. And many references to animals as a result have been basically buried in the historical haystack, um, essentially undiscoverable. Once those texts are digitized and searchable, um, even with the flaws that exist in, in, in those processes, um, it becomes easier to surface references to these uh, marginalized topics. Um, so for instance, an article about, you know, holiday celebrations in Central Park might turn out to have information about dogs, horses, pigeons, and squirrels. An article about urban slums might have uh, information about cockroaches and rats. An article about diplomacy might have uh, information about giant pandas or thoroughbred horses and so forth. Uh, in my, and in my own work on the history of urban squirrels in the United States, which I started right around the time that I was working on that animal rights piece, um, I found that the full text, uh, full text searchability of digitized um, newspaper databases made a huge difference. I don't think I could have done that project in the way I did um, without having those sources. Now I should say that, yeah, and even though I should, I should say, squirrels do occasionally appear in headlines, um, but the vast majority of sources that I did end up drawing on for that kind of work um, uh, were kind of these kinds of passing references that I think would really have been almost impossible to find without uh, digitized databases. Now, aside from the reliance on kind of keyword searches through of digitized databases, uh, my techniques for that project were not very sophisticated um, and certainly not kind of algorithmically complex in any way. Um, but in uh, the past decade or so, animal historians have begun to develop much more sophisticated ways of analyzing digitized historical sources. And these are just two examples that I think are, are kind of uh, have been interesting and integrated into, into broader scholarly projects in ways that make them not just um, entertaining visualizations, but actually intellectually, intellectually significant projects. Um, on the left, you can see a, a model of the locations of retail butchers in San Francisco in the late 19th century developed by Andy Robichaud and Eric Steiner at Stanford. Um, and on the right, you can see uh, an interactive map of the um, railroad networks and the spread of, um, of an epizootic um, in 1872 to 1873, um, developed by Sean Karaj. So, um, you know, these scholars have shown how digitized maps and business listings and newspaper accounts can be analyzed with GIS software to really generate some new insights into past geographies of the animal industry um, and animal disease. Now, another potential source for new animal, for animal history, but I think one that has yet to make a big impact, um, though it should, and, and maybe is uh, kind of, there's, there's, there's stuff in the works, um, comes from the digi digitization of non-textual sources, um, including photographs and video and, you know, pictured here, audio, uh, audio recordings. 
um, as well as digitized um, versions or, or um, photographs and other information about natural history specimens. So to date, such sources, as, as far as I'm aware, have mainly been studied by media historians and historians of science who are primarily interested in the way that these representations and archiving systems have developed over time. Um, I was thought it was tremendously exciting to see the previous uh, session um, with pre the presentations on, on sonic archives and, and how those things could be used to recover animal pasts, or even as uh, I think Hannah Hunter was saying, to, to conduct oral histories of, of non-human animals. I think that's an incredibly uh, promising direction to go in, but one that not hasn't yet um, uh, been brought, you know, kind of brought to, to its full potential. And it's my sense that the, 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 the same thing can be said for digitized film and photographic archives. There's a lot of potential here to open up new kinds of historical interpretations that recognize animals in some kind of limited but very real sense as co-authors of such documents, of such traces under particular social te socio-technical conditions. Um, but so far that recognition, I think, remains largely, uh, um, largely, largely an unrealized potential. And, one th and I think one, one reason that we have maybe not as, I think more, at least among historians, haven't been kind of quick to draw on these sorts of uh, archives uh, in order to tell histories that center animals is that we tend to be skeptical and I think appropriately so of positivist claims about historical evidence as, as a kind of direct transparent window onto the past. And we tend to be even more skeptical when those kinds of claims are made about direct access to, to animal pasts, non-human pasts. So I think we tend to see, you know, a photograph of an animal as being mainly a reflection of the a, a product of the photographer's eye and hand, or maybe of the overall kind of technical system that and, and uh, sort of discourses that make that kind of production possible. We see it that way, kind of as a human product, rather than as an artifact artifact that results from the situated process of of multi-species interaction. But my hope is that you know, as these kinds of digital sources become more uh, widely available, that more and more historians will start to interpret these these traces in that way, right? Not just as reflections of what animal what humans thought about animals a century ago, but also as a reflection of particular moments in which humans and animals together kind of produced an artifact asymmetrically, right? Un unequally, but nonetheless in some kind of relation, uh, produced an artifact for later interpretation. Now, to be really clear, I think it's not easy to I don't think that it's easy to interpret the meaning of a dog's bark or a bird's song recorded a century ago. Nor do I think that an audio recording of a dog's bark or a bird's song offers less mediated access to that dog's um, lived reality than a textual des description, for instance, might. Um, but I do think uh, those sorts of um, traces um, have some kind of historical meaning that can't be reduced to human attitudes. And also that an audio recording or a photograph provides a different kind of mediated access to the past um, than a textual description does, for instance. Okay. Oh yeah, I meant to uh, also mention uh, that um, in the context of um, photographic um, archives and, and other kinds of media archives, um, there are kind of incredible resources out there. In some cases, resources that actually have not been able, able to survive. This is one example archive that have not been able to survive um, for their, in order to accomplish their original purpose, which was a kind of educational uh, one, um, but which represent potentially incredible resources for future historians um, who may be able to draw on these to get insights into 20th and early 21st century uh, animal lives. Okay. Um, cats and Facebook. So in addition to the rapid digitization of more than human traces created in the past, we're, we're also in the middle of an era when born digital traces are piling up in digital archives faster than they can be counted, let alone interpreted. And it's my sense that these kinds of sources are not yet making a big impact on historical scholarship, except for a very thin sliver of the recent past. But they are also, for good reason, uh, preoccupying archivists and will almost certainly loom large in future histories of the present, including future histories of today's animals. So starting with, let me start with social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so forth, TikTok. These are not just platforms for narcissistic self-expression or the manipulation of public opinion. They're also incredibly rich archives of more than human traces. 
And depending on if and how such traces are preserved and made accessible, historians in the future may be able to learn through their affective embodied encounters with these archives, not just the ways that you know, videos and texts and images of animals um, were used to entertain humans or express affinities and, and so forth, but, but also to learn something about how real animals actually lived in the early 21st century, the material constitution of their environments, their relationships to humans, their bodies, their behaviors, uh, and much else. Just to take a, a kind of obvious example, and I'm, I realize the potential for humor here, but I, I wanna take it seriously for a second. Um, we've never had, I don't think, in the history, in the entire history of humanity, a record that is this detailed and this diverse of the living environments of domesticated cats and the nature of their relationships to humans, let alone a record of all the discourse uh, that, that surrounds those cats um, and their situations. And of course, this is a this record is the product of a socio-technical apparatus that in no way is unbiased or objective. But then again, no historical source is, right? I mean, no document is entirely um, uh, unbiased or objective. And I think animal historians, and I'm thinking of people here like Susan Nance, um, are already in the process of starting to figure out how to use these texts uh, to tell recent histories of, of human animal relations that take the animal, that again, that center the animal, right? Rather than just seeing it as an expression of, of human ideas. The past two decades have also seen, um, and we've seen, uh, I think in the, the past two days, some really um, uh, fascinating accounts of, of these kinds of um, uh, efforts, um, have seen the growth of a variety of, of much more systematic ways of producing uh, more than human traces of animal lives, including citizen science projects. So we could think of, you know, the birding websites and apps of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the various kinds of research projects available through crowd uh, kind of sourced science sites like Zooniverse, um, or something like the iNaturalist um, kind of app and initiative, uh, which is a project of the National Geographic Society and the California Academy of Sciences, which currently has more than three and a half million people signed up and, and at any given time, more than 150,000 active users. And as Soledad Altrudi has argued in practice, these kinds of apps and platforms often encourage, at least implicitly, a, a fairly shallow, scientized, competitive, and very anthropocentric way of engaging with nature, which is their, you know, at least one of their nominal aims. Um, but again, as with social media, I think if we turn our attention from the human subject to the entire inscription system of which the human subject is just one part, um, despite the potentially trivializing or alienating part, uh, aspects of these uh, systems, we can still see a very powerful socio-technical apparatus for generating more than human traces that may be of use to future historians. So finally, let me conclude uh, this section on born digital traces uh, by saying a few words about digital and elect, uh, electronic forms of animal tracking, which is one small part of that broader world of environmental sensing that Jennifer Gabriese's work has, has done so much to illuminate. So recent techno-scientific initiatives, and I'm thinking here of the, the satellite-based tracking system, ICRIS, that was uh, recently launched, um, as well as the, the MoveBank uh, database of animal movement data that is uh, connected to it. Um, these kinds of initiatives have been dramatically expanding the variety of animals whose movements can be tracked, the precision and scope of tracking, the amount of other kinds of environmental data that can be collected along with uh, those movement uh, tracks. Um, and at the same time, they have developed tools, um, algorithms for aggregating and analyzing and contextualizing that data um, that are increasingly powerful, increasingly automatic, um, increasingly accessible. And you know, from, from my perspective, this is, of course, is an interesting phenomenon for thinking about um, how conservation operates right now um, or how science operates right now. But it's also a, um, as, you know, viewed in a as, a, as a set of, as an archive or a set of sources for historical work, it's also a, a significant development. Um, Bill Adams, Note, has noted that animal tracking data not only have these sorts of contemporary practical implications for, implications for conservation, but also produce a record that at least in theory is eternal. So that in the sense that the track of an animal, a particular elephant, let's say, um, that is raiding, has raided the fields of Kenyan farmers night after night, those tracks actually remain long after the, the elephant has died. Um, platforms like MoveBank, are meant to address those contemporary uh, conservation challenges, um, but I don't think it's too much of a stretch to see them in, in their the quality as kind of preservers of traces of long dead animals um, as archives in potentia. And of course, this is just one small subset of a, of a much larger world of, 
of digital sensing data um, that is creating these, uh, laying down these sort of very uneven, uh, very um, contingent um, archival strata for future historians to unearth. So in short, as, as both uh, digital and born digital, uh, digitized and born digital faces proliferate, we're seeing, I think, the emergence of a new kind of archive for telling animal histories. Um, and I think that's an archive that doesn't just make it easier to answer the same kind of questions that we've always posed, but is actually making it possible to answer new kinds of questions. Um, for instance, questions about the, the, the individual decisions that individual wild you know, migrating birds have made under particular environmental and social conditions in the past. Okay. Let me move now to the, the third and final um, kind of section of, the, of my talk. Um, so the, hold here for a second. So the digitalization of animal history that I've just described is creating new affordances and opportunities for embodied affective encounters with the more than human traces of past animal lives. To conclude, I'd like to describe some, a few considerations that I think are necessary to ensure that this digitalization actually does help the field uh, fulfill its potential and, and does so in a way that remains faithful to what I see as the fundamental ethical impulse of writing more than human histories, which is to be responsive and responsible to our co-constitutive entanglements with the non-human world. And these three considerations have to do respectively with ontological constraints, um, affective encounters, and environment, environmental entanglements. And so I'll take those now um, each uh, after the other. So let me start with the first, um, which has to do with the kinds of ontologies that get built into digital databases and search algorithms. In my own work on the history of animal tracking, I've examined the movement-centric ontologies that um, get built into research programs, instruments, and databases um, for tracking animal movements. By flattening differences among kinds of movement, these uh, ontologies unleash scientists to pursue provocative similarities between widely different species and to develop universalistic, ahistorical, and decontextualized models of motion and mobility. The point of saying this is not to dismiss, to dismiss such pursuits and models as scientifically or politically illegitimate, nor is it to say that such pursuits are hopelessly contaminated by human perspectives and ideologies such that they ultimately tell us nothing about uh, non-human pasts, that they're good for a history of human attitudes towards animals, but not for a real um, genuine history of animals. On the contrary, so far as I'm in a position to judge, I think, generally speaking, this is good science. It tells us, at least by the standards by which science is usually judged, it tells us something new and often surprising about the world. Um, and moreover I, moreover, I think these, the kind of archives that are growing around this sort of movement data um, really do provide a rich and promising source about uh, real historians, uh, about real animals for future historians. So the point of critically assessing the ontologies that underlie these sorts of uh, projects is to really just to say that future historians, to the, to the extent that they're interested in telling a history of, of, of animals, will need to read and interpret the, these archives of animal movement data, not as transparent windows onto the past, but rather as material traces that certain non-human animals were able to leave via a complex socio-technical apparatus that allowed only certain kinds of inscriptions to be made and not others. So they'll have to, you know, put it differently, they're, they're going to have to grapple with the way in which the structure of this particular archive determines what's allowed to be written, allowed to be written, whether the writer is a human or not. And I think one kind of practical implication just means that historians of animals will also inevitably, if they want to do their job well, have to be historians of the social socio-technical apparatuses that make that kind of inscription possible, uh, that provided them with the sources that they use. The second consideration has to do with the embedded affective encounters of the historian with digital animal traces. I think as our experience of Zoom life um, has made clear, I think to most of us anyway, over the past year or so, um, the digital can feel like a thin channel, um, no matter how many bits are flowing. Um, and the same goes for digital animal traces. No, man, no matter how many millions or billions of data points about animals we might have access to, they can still feel less compelling than encountering a single living animal in the flesh. And so my point in bringing this up is not to say that the digital traces are somehow disembodied, immaterial or affect free, let alone to say that they're illegitimate or unreal. Um, as I hope I've made clear by now, I think um, digitalization opens up some really promising paths for animal history. 
And I also think that all encounters with, with animals, whether they take place in the flesh or through the screen are mediated and material. And so the point again is of, of, of mounting this sort of critique or at least pointing out um, the, the, the differences here is, is simply to say that what matters is what kinds of embodied material affect, uh, affect, affective encounters are afforded by digitalization as it's being implemented right now um, and, and for whom, right? And how those affordances relate to or differ from the affordances of non-digital sources. So it's, you know, to me, it's clear that like interacting with digital sources is just as embodied and affective an experience as interacting with printed books or going to a natural history museum and opening up a drawer of, of skins um, to examine them. Um, but it's differently embodied. And it can engage us affectively in very different ways. I think we all know that the digital can be exciting, it can be, cons can be consuming. Right? It can pull us in and it can excite us and animate us in all sorts of ways. But those ways are different than the ways that an, a, a paper archive can um, or that an animal skin can. Okay, and now just to come to my kind of third and final kind of consideration for thinking about the impact of digitalization on how we might engage with and encounter animal pasts. I don't think animal historians who embrace the digital turn, and I would consider myself to be one of those, um, can ignore the materiality of the digital as it affects the present day lives of non-human animals um, and the nature of their relations to humans. My own work on radio tracking has made me especially sensitive to the violent technicities of digital trace making that depend on equipping animals with electronic sensors and transmitters. And I think, you know, as some of the, the talks in this conference have pointed out, these are techniques that are also tightly connected to various forms of human violence uh, and violence against humans. And of course, we can't forget those broader um, problems with waste, with mining, air and water pollution, climate change, and so forth um, that are linked to our digital infrastructures. So I think we need to, or maybe I need to temper any uh, enthusiasm we might feel about the scholarly affordances of the, affordances of the digital with a recognition of its material environmental entanglements, and, and maybe not just a recognition of those costs and entanglements, but also doing something about them. I don't know exactly what that, what that would mean. I think it, it wouldn't mean, uh, probably wouldn't mean carbon offsets for historical research, um, but it might mean other things like uh, some kind of practices of data restraint, right? Like um, drawing on just enough data to answer the questions we want to answer um, and not more, right? In some effort to resist the, both the environmental costs of these digital infrastructures and also our, our potential contribution to um, uh, technical cultures of surveillance. So I'm not sure what it would look like, but I don't think historians in good consciousness and good conscience can really celebrate the growing abundance of digital sources without grappling with these ethical and environmental considerations. Okay, now just to conclude a couple more words. Um, I don't think any of these kinds of considerations, the ontological, the affective, the, the environmental is, is really new or unique to the digital in, in their broad outlines. You might think of natural history collections of animal specimens as a sort of non-digital, uh, non non-textual source for, for history. These kinds of natural history collections were often acquired by nefarious means, in any case, tightly linked to imperial and, and, and capitalist projects. They often depended on the the, the killing of animals, all, almost always often painful killing of animals. In some extreme cases, they contributed to the local extirpation or even the extinction of species. They're profoundly and irreversibly shaped by certain kinds of uh, classificatory ontologies, uh, which mean that some aspects of animal past are rendered almost entirely invisible by these systems. And access to natural history collections has never been equitable. Even the digitization of um, these sorts of collections doesn't make access to them entirely equitable. So there's nothing innocent about any archive, right? Um, whether it's digital or not. And so I think in that sense, um, being critical of the emerging digital, digital archive is part and parcel of being cr critical of archives per se. But the specifics matter, right? So what's true of natural history specimens is true of digital traces, but in a different way. Um, and I would, you know, if historical traces are always material, embodied, situated, and more than human, and if the ways they are embodied and material and so forth really matter, then we need to attend to the very particular ways that digital traces are changing the basic affordances of historical scholarship and, and hailing historians into new kinds of responsibilities. And actually having listened to some of the talks uh, given yesterday and today, I think a lot of the work 
it, there is already being done, right? And in, in the case of history, it's a matter of connecting our contemporary critiques of these practices of surveillance um, and, and uh, to the, the, the work of, of reconstructing animal pasts. So um, I'll, I think I'll leave it there for now um, because I've uh, held your attention, I hope uh, for long enough, at what I know is, has been a long couple of days. Um, thanks for thanks for listening. Thanks to everybody who's given amazing talks over the past couple of days, um, and I look forward to your questions.